All right. So, um, so what I'm talking about here is a little bit um, about, uh, you know, some experience that we have from from servicing a large number of customers at at Enterprise DB. So I'm I'm going to run through some statistics, uh, some data that we have, some things that that shape our thinking about, uh, you know, where where customers are struggling potentially with Postgres. Uh, where there might be things that the, that the product can be improved at, um, but also where we can shape our training and where we are shaping or how we're trying to improve our customer communication. Right? So that's really what I'm trying to do here. It's, it's not so much to, to talk about you know, how great we are. It's really just to communicate this is where the weaknesses are, this is where people run into problems, um, and these are the things where I believe Postgres as a product uh, you know, can potentially think about closing some gaps or, or becoming even more, even easier to use. Um, so, as usual, I have to bore you 30 seconds with uh, about Enterprise DB, but again, I'll keep it really, really quick. Uh, and then I'll talk about, uh, you know, what we do in terms of migrations. So, what do we see there? Uh, support experiences and then health checks. Uh, a lot of this material in here was not just compiled by me, but by a lot of people who work uh, with me on, on supporting customers. Kevin is one of them, that often if, if things are really, really difficult, they end up with Kevin, uh, and then he helps figure them out. So some of the data in here also uh, 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 was provided by Kevin and other members of, uh, of the team that he works on. So again, EDB, as I said yesterday, all we do is Postgres, right? And we think we meet everybody's needs with Postgres, both with a supporting the community edition and then supporting, uh, you know, a, a private distribution and doing that with remote DBA services, 24 by 7 support services and professional services. And really what I did for this presentation here is I analyzed the data that we got of remote, out of remote DBA, 24 by 7 support, and then one very specific type of service that we deliver, which is called a health check, which is usually what happens when something went awry, something went bump in the night, and the customer calls and says, hey, please, please, please come quickly. Um, you know, it's not working. Um, so that's really what we do. And again, here we take what, what I think is really, really a cool open source database. I think the best open source relational database today um, and we add features that our enterprise customers want, and that's what, so that's, that's basically all we do. So let me talk a little bit about migrations. Um, the majority of interest that we get today for migrations is migrations from Oracle, and then followed by a SQL Server, DB2, very few, MySQL, rare. Okay, so we see very few uh, instances where people want to migrate off MySQL, I'm um, not sure why. Well, I think I understand why, but you know, I wish to, uh, more people would see that they can actually do it quite easily with, with Postgres. And part of my keynote yesterday was intended to, to help people understand that it is actually easy to do with Postgres, easier than it was maybe five or so years ago. Um, it's interesting that we're seeing a rapid increase uh, in migrations uh, from SQL Server after the end of 2014, uh, after the, uh, uh, starting in 2014, and that's basically driven by um, Microsoft changing their pricing model. Okay, so again, as we're looking forward, I think that's another opportunity, it's another turf uh, that we can get into. Um, so there's obstacles in the migrations. I mean, some things like uh, if you come from Oracle, there's the concept of the autonomous transaction um, and the merge concept that, that are quite commonly used in Oracle, and it's very difficult to find an equivalent uh, for, that, uh, for that in Postgres. And then uh, scalability. That's something that we bump into a bit. Um, more the rack concept. That is something where I think Oracle has done an, an absolutely great job at marketing um, a concept yeah, yeah, it, it, it is, it's a really nice concept because basically what Rack does is peace of mind for the DBA, right? It does a whole lot of things at the same time, but if you really look into them, most customers don't use a million dollars worth of features, 
So when they really start looking at, okay, so what do I do with Iraq? Is that really worth this amount of money? No. And then once we start peeling back the onion, then it turns out that Postgres can do most of this stuff and can do it very well at an extremely low cost. Okay? But conceptually, Postgres doesn't have an equivalent, and that, that sort of makes a lot of migrations more difficult. Um, um, then when we look at a migration, one of the first questions that I ask a customer is, do you use um, something like Hibernate? Okay? Because that's like the prime indicator. When somebody says, oh yeah, we're using Hibernate, it's, this is going to be a relatively easy migration. So again, when you look forward or when you work with somebody coming off SQL Server or Oracle and wanting to go to Postgres, that is a prime indicator that that is a potentially a, a, a really, really nice target. Because when they use Hibernate, they don't tend to use packages, T-SQL, PLSQL, any of the proprietary extensions because most of the business logic tends to happen in the application. It's not always true, but it's a really good indicator that you know, if somebody gives you a list of 20, pick the one that, where they use Hibernate because that's a good, that's a good first guess. Um, and then you know, we, we know that from our experience, most migrations are really easy to do. The challenge is really when you're in a migration situation, find the other 30% really quickly and put them aside. Focus on the 70% that are easily doable because most people don't use all the features, right? And then you got to find the ones that use all the features and sort of, you know, move those to the back burner. That's really our key experience from the migrations, um, you know, Look for somebody using an object relational framework and for somebody who uses very few of the proprietary constructs. And then most migrations are really, really easy. We have not found a lot where, where uh, Postgres can't handle the workload. That's very rare. Okay, uh, any questions about the migration topic? Does that, does that correlate with what you guys are seeing? Okay. Um, Okay, so support experiences. Um, so why did we analyze support tickets? It's really what we're seeing is that um, more and more Postgres users are not dyed in the wool community members who've been with Postgres for a long time. But there's a lot more people coming to Postgres from Oracle, from SQL Server, okay? And they run into very specific problems with Postgres because there are certain areas where Postgres is different from SQL Server and Oracle and if you're not equipped for them you get into a lot of trouble. Okay, So that's really one thing that we're seeing. Uh, on the other side is we're seeing that Postgres is moving into a lot more complex applications which basically means for us what's interesting is we see in our user base the knowledge of Postgres going up but the complexity of the questions and problems that they're coming up with is growing, right? Because they're getting into much more complex applications and much more mission critical applications. Um, and then, so we're looking now at, at finding out how do we make our Postgres users more successful. And I think there's some things in here that we're already working on in terms of training and white papers to give people very specific guides as to this is how you do the following. And these are the 10 things that you have to do, right? Even though you may not think you have to do them because you never did them in your career as an Oracle DBA. But on Postgres, you have to do them. So um, just a little bit about what we do. Today, we, sort of, we support about 2,500 customers. Okay, so what's interesting is in this, in this graph here, uh, the number of contracts that we support has gone up significantly, but the number of tickets has not. That has really something to do with the fact that the user base understands more and more about Postgres, how to use it, but the complexity of the tickets has changed quite a bit. Okay? Um, and I must say, having been a SQL Server and Oracle guy, that the stability of the product is great. Okay? I always, I, I'm always uh, sort of jokingly complaining that Postgres is too good. For me, running services, it's too good because too many customers say after a year or two, hey, I never used support. Why do I need to pay for somebody to be there 7 by 24? I never called them. 
And it's true that, uh, you know, once they're up and running, the number of uh, what we call severity ones that we get is extremely rare. Across that install base, we get less than one severity one a month. Okay? That's how good the product is, which is sort of bad for my business. It's good for my sleep, but bad for my business. Um, so talking a little bit about the tickets and platforms. Uh, and, and that's one of the things that we're obviously looking at because our training and our sort of user awareness has a lot to do with, okay, what do you deploy on? That's one of the key questions coming again from people migrating from other environments onto Postgres. And so we have our, our own proprietary distribution and we have the, 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 the open source uh, distribution. And I'm showing the statistics for both and you'll see that there is a, a good bit of difference in here. There is a strong mix here on the, uh, a strong uh, use of, of RHEL and Windows, so the, 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 the commercially supported platforms, whereas on PostgreSQL, um, the other Linux, which is largely CentOS, um, is, uh, is, is, is the, the primary install base. And what's interesting is overall, in this exercise, based on our tickets, okay, and I'll, I'll show you another, another analysis a little bit later, based on our tickets, 77% of the action appears to be on Linux. Later on, we'll see that I think the, the, the Windows install base is even smaller, okay? I think it is actually, it's, it's, it's going to be somewhere 10 to 15 percent where we see really um, uh, Postgres in production, okay? So again, as we think about training, as we think about, you know, awareness, um, this is really, I think, what we should be, what we should be focusing on. Um, okay, when do customers call? This is sort of, this is sort of interesting. Um, so we divide the life cycle of a customer into proof of concept, development, deployment, maintenance. Not everybody goes through proof of concept, okay? Uh, a lot of people just, you know, feel comfortable. They start developing and, and, and off they go. But what's interesting for us is that the majority of the calls are coming later. Now, you may say, all right, but customers are longer in maintenance and deployment, right? And that's the reason. Maybe that is true, but I think there's something else behind that, which is the message that getting started on Postgres is quite easy, okay? But there are some things that people need to get aware of when they move into deployment and maintenance, okay? And they're really, they're tuning and bloat, okay? Because tuning and bloat are different. So, we have a lot of folks that go through these phases of POC and development easily. And what we're trying to tell them now is, hey, there's a couple of things that you need to prepare for. You as a DBA, you have all the time in the world to get ready during POC and development. But be sure that every single parameter in the config file that you're absolutely comfortable with, that you know how to handle hba.conf right, that you know exactly how to do authorization, authentication, and accounting for that, right? That's, that's really important because, again, it is different. Make sure you understand how backup and recovery works in Postgres because it is different, okay? I'm not saying it is hard or anything like that. It's just different. Having been a SQL Server guy, you know, there, backup and recovery has a certain way of doing it. Looking at it in Postgres, it's different. So take the time during development to get ready for that and don't call us in a frenzy and say, oh my God, oh my God, my tables are growing. What's happening? What's happening? You know? Um, or, oh my God, I, I, I don't have enough room anymore. You know? They've grown so far and, and, and now nothing works. And that's the kind of calls that we're getting. So what we're trying to do is, is use this period up front to create more awareness. Let me dig into details a little bit more. So, again, the, the, so this the, on top is like 100% chart, uh, distribution chart, and just saying, okay, what are customers calling about? Um, um, and, and you can see that during proof of concept and during, uh, during the development phase, there's a lot of questions around how to, et cetera. And the, the percentage breakout of those appears to be about the same, except later on during deployment and maintenance, obviously there's a lot more uh, uh, questions around tuning. And the corruption questions often have to do with, uh, you know, misunderstood notions of backup, right? 
you know, file system backups, snapshots, all that kind of stuff that are just being sort of squirreled away and applied again, and then it doesn't work. So going into it in a bit more detail. Um, so this is, again, broken up the, in another way. So, so this way is, is all the calls. And then within that column of calls, where, um, where are the key problems? Well, what's interesting here for us is that we see that the, the number of questions overall around how to and product awareness are, are growing during the deployment and maintenance phase. Okay? So at that point in time, the operational aspects of using Postgres, that's what's hitting people. Okay? How to program against it and how to use it and how to get it up and running, that doesn't have a lot of, there's not a lot of questions popping up there. But it's really around these later phases. So you can see that, uh, that almost 61, 62% of, of all the interactions that we're getting have to do with understanding the product, how to do something that is different than in their conventional environment, and then tuning questions. Okay? And I think that is something that, at least for us, influences our development of things like PEM, backup and recovery tools, uh, et cetera, because that's where, that's where the problems are. Okay? And having been a support guy for a long time, I know it's not about the knowledge base to get the questions answered quickly. It's about making sure that the question does not pop up at all. Okay, so we're looking, this, looking at this to influence how we shape, you know, at least our extensions to the product and, and our training and our literature. Key questions that are coming up. How-to questions. Um, things like how to set up connection pooling. Well, and again, having been a SQL Server and Oracle guy, uh, that's not a question because the connection pooler is built in. Right? So you didn't have to worry about that. Here, it's outside, and it gives you tremendous other opportunity, but you've got to understand how to use it, okay? And what you can do with it, and what do you do in the application? What do you do in, let's say, uh, PG Pool or PG Balancer? How to use them? Which one to use them, right? Um, standby and streaming replica. I mean, yeah, we had that in all the other commercial tools, but they were always add-ons. They were complicated to set up, not anywhere near as elegant as simple as we have it since, since release 9. Uh, table spaces, partitions, upgrades. Again, all of that is where we have the slight differences. Uh, and then the big ones, really bloat, 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 bloat. If there's one thing that, that really um, uh, drives our customers nuts still today is bloat. We have too many people still, no matter what we say, that just say, oh, vacuum, that's, that's 2 3%. I get performance. You know, I'll just turn it off and the database is faster. See, I turned it off. It's faster already. Okay? <laughs> and, you know, that, that's something that again and again and again uh, uh, hits people in the head. And, and unfortunately, they find out about it uh, usually when it's, um, uh, when it's sort of too late. Um, and then auditing questions, I guess that's also when we look forward at the Postgres roadmap, a big question. Yes, please. No, they just they turn it off. Or Kevin. Yeah. Yes, the default settings are, and so that I think that is uh, that is one of the key problems that in many environments now that the the CPU the horsepower is such that the default that the machine outruns the default settings. Um, okay, and then obviously, you know, hpa.conf, postgresql.conf, understanding that. So I think it's an absolute key message to, to push that forward, that people need to learn about that before it's too late. And basically, use the initial phases to, to uh, figure that out. So a second thing that we do is uh, what we call an architectural health check. That's where... In our world, uh, you know, usually a customer calls and says, it's not working, or it's, it's gotten to be really slow, or, you know, we're getting into the Christmas season and I'm worried, um, or, you know, uh, it, it, it failed over. Well, it failed, but it didn't come back, you know, and what did I do? What, so that's the kind of 
help situation. So somebody goes on site for, for a couple of days, runs a bunch of analysis scripts, looks at the customer requirements, and develops a recommendation. Um, so what happens in there, it's a, it's a top to bottom review. We look at security performance and you know all of these things. The, the analysis that I'm going to present is something that Tom Brown helped me do in, in the UK. Um, he looked at uh, 20 AHCs that we did in, in 2013. So he went through all of them to say, OK, what are the most common things that we find? And again, how can we shape customer education? How can we also shape our own products to make sure that, uh, that we avoid the problems and don't fix them? Um, so H the, the, uh, the configuration file. And what we did here is to say the 20, I think it's 25 most common parameters that were, um, that were changed the most often, right? So where did we need to do some changes in the, uh, in the configuration file most often, right? And it turns out that cache size, shared buffers, uh, working memory, et cetera, are really the most frequent things that are not understood, okay? Not understood correctly, not configured correctly. Um, the, one, the lines in red is input that I got from Kevin and from Robert Haas. This is where they expected most of the, um, the changes to be, but the blue is really what we found as an, as an actual distribution. Okay? So again, here for us, for us, the result of this analysis is that we need to be much more prescriptive for our customers to say, this is exactly how you do this. Because in our architectural health checks, we, our consultants, use a predefined math, which is not always absolutely right, but it's a strong guideline to say, this is exactly how you set the parameters. This is where they should be for the different workloads. And in, in, in our Postgres Enterprise Manager, that's also one of the smarts that the tool has to, to, to automatically set the parameters to what we think are the recommended values. Well, we have too many situations, and you can see here, like in over 90% of the cases, or if you go a little bit further down, I mean, in over 70% over of the cases, these parameters had to be adjusted. Now, keep in mind that these are only people calling for help, okay? So this is not, you can't just extrapolate and say, oh, always these things have to be done. No, this, these are people calling for help. Um, kernel parameters. Um, Obviously, those first two is, are things that very often need, uh, need changes. Now, what's interesting here is that as we get into larger companies, we have a disconnect between the DBA, the sysadmin, and the team managing storage. Okay? So one of the key messages that we're now sending to our customers is, this, to, to, to get the performance, it's not just about the DBA, right? And in Oracle, it's different because Oracle owns everything down to the disk, okay? In Postgres, that's not how it works. The DBA needs to work with the sysadmin or needs to work with the storage guys to make sure that all these three things are in sync. It's different, okay? It's not impossible. It's not hard. It's just different. So... It, as part of our webinars about you know how to be a good DBA, uh, part of the message is you got to get these three parties to the table, because if you don't have the the background ratio and the dirty ratio set correctly, you're not going to get the performance that you need, and you got to get that fixed, even though it's not your parameter to adjust. Um, Something, again, that we saw in, our, in, in, in this analysis, analysis, and I just want to set it straight here, that the majority of, of the people calling us for help for this specific service were running on PostgreSQL, okay? not on our uh, proprietary distribution. Um, okay, back up and standby. I mean, yeah, we talked a lot about tuning, right? A fast database is an important database, but a database that's still there is even more important, right? Um, and what's interesting is that um, when we went out to do architectural health checks, 43% of our customers, of the people that called us for this, would not have been able to do a point-in-time recovery. Okay? And a large, way too large, had no backup provision in place at all. Okay? 
Yes, please. Would they not have been able to do it because they hadn't set it up or because it wasn't working or they hadn't touched it that they would be able to do it now? They, they had no provision for it. Oh. So, so and again, keep in mind, these are people calling for help, right? So it's not that this is true across all installations. But again, for us, it's a strong indication that how to do that part of the job is not so clear, right? Okay, so that, for example, influenced our development of, of a, a backup and recovery tool because we felt, hey, we, we, there's got to be something, something, similar, uh, something similar to do it out there. But again, even those that had something in place, right, um, they, again, did not correctly understand how to combine physical and logical backup and why you need to have both in Postgres. Because again, in uh, Oracle or SQL Server, you don't need to think about the difference between physical and, and logical. It's all the same thing. In Postgres, you gotta understand when do I do what and how do I combine both schedules correctly. Okay, and I think that's, we, from a lot of other customer interactions, I know that uh, that, that, that distinction is, 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 is quite problematic. Okay, stand by. Um, over half had uh, hot or, I mean, a significant part had hot or warm standby, but again, a significant amount, uh, a significant number of customers did not use a standby as a way to, to get high availability, which again worries us because it's out of the box. It's not an additional product. It's cheap. It's easy. Do it, right? You can only win if you do it. Um, maintenance tasks. Um, the majority here, I mean, the, the big ones, like unused indexes, missing primary key, missing indexes, that's pretty standard stuff. You'll find that, that that's a problem that every DBA or every database has or every, every database product has. But bloat, bloat, again, is something that too many people don't understand that bloat is a major concern in Postgres. It's not a big problem, but you've got to address it right away. And you can't wait until it's too late, right? If you're almost out of space, well, you're going to go down. There's no other way. Um, okay, so um, in our AHCs, we saw that Windows was less prevalent than I initially uh, said about because of the tickets. Okay, now, and I, and I believe that is because we get a lot of tickets uh, during the pre-production phases, but architectural health checks are done during the production phase. Okay, so I think. The mix of uh, uh, Linux versus Windows is more like 10 to 15 percent Windows, okay? Uh, and the rest, the uh, rest being Linux. Um, as I said already, most DBAs are not familiar enough with uh, the, the interaction with the storage system, the SAN, um, and the whole discussion around when to use direct, direct attached storage, when to use SAN. You know why NFS may not be a good idea at all, okay? Uh, because again, Oracle supports NFS, okay? So a lot of people think, well, Oracle does it. Why, do, why should it not work in Postgres? And the problem is during the install, it'll work just fine. And then at some point in time, it'll stop working. It'll stop working in a very, very nasty way, okay? So again, this is something that we're pushing forward to help people understand what do you use and why, okay? We have a lot of discussions internally inside our company about fiber channel versus iSCSI and what should we really say and how do we help customers understand what they need to do with iSCSI to make it work reliably, okay? And, you know, some, some factions in our company say, no, fiber channel, fiber channel, but it's hugely expensive. So we want to help customers find the right balance there but help them understand for sure that NFS is not a good idea. Um, because that does cause middle of the night calls, and I do not like middle of the night calls. Um, okay, and then um, you know the 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 uh, operating system integration and the adjustment of necessary uh, OS parameters is also something that we need to create a lot of awareness for. Um, and we're working on very targeted education packages that that uh, integrate the three functions, so that the DBA, the sysadmin, and the storage guys are all getting you know something that they can work off all together that addresses things like the file system, the storage system, what should I be using on which operating system, et cetera, because there's still a lot of confusion out there. Um, okay, so in summary, what this helped us understand is where we need to collect more data during our support interactions, 
Because again, as I was digging through this, there's way too many things where I don't know yet enough. Hey, this specific white paper or product feature it needs to focus on this area to make this type of problem go away. So this helped us drive even more, um, more data collection dur during support. But then also it's influencing a lot of what we do uh, in, in, let's say, when we decide about our, about our community focus, but also in the, let's say, peripheral add-ons that we develop around Postgres, such as uh, the backup and recovery tool that is certainly driven by what we saw in here, or features in PEM, uh, where, again, we want to make sure that these calls just go away um, and, and not just be answered uh, more easily. I had a lot of people help me in this, um, in, in pulling this, this data together. Gabrielle was one of them. Kevin, Kevin certainly helped. Tom did a lot of the analysis. Robert uh, chimed in quite a bit. So there's a lot of people that, uh, that pitched into uh, making this happen. So I hope this was useful. Um, and questions, discussions? If anybody wants the presentation, we'll put it up on SlideShare. So if somebody wants the data, yes, please. Maintenance questions, yes, okay, um, but I can't tell you because we we don't we don't really track when somebody does the installation. I could go back and say when did they buy support, right, um, and then when are the first calls coming in. We have quite a few situations where uh, they frantically buy support because they've sort of gotten this far, and now they've promise to go live uh, sometimes like on Monday and uh, <laughs> um, so you know it usually usually there's a quite a quite a short lag I mean large companies tend to behave differently where you know so they have a more structured process and they get training and all that kind of stuff but then the small mid-sized companies where somebody got a little bit too brave and promised something and then they're starting to run into a wall or they say, ooh, this is more data, what, 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 what do I do, right? Yeah, that, that's, it. That, that's exactly what we're seeing, and that's where uh, then the questions are, oh, oh, backup. Oh, yeah, I, I, I did backup. Uh, what, what, what exactly did you do, base backup, or what did you do? Oh, no, I backed up the file system. It's okay. It's good. We got a backup, uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, um, or, uh, you know, when I run out of disk space, I just throw away all those pesky log files. Just get rid of them. Um, so it's that kind of stuff where, where people – find it easy to get started, but the operational aspects um, are, I mean, this is just like any database, but even if you've been experienced with SQL Server and Oracle, there are differences in how to operate it. All right, well, yes? And we're advising people now to run tests and basically z walk them through, okay, when do you do logical backup, when do you do physical backup, and how often do you take your physical backup, and actually you got to measure, you know. If you're told that you got, I don't know, 20 minutes for a point in time recovery, right, well, you got to make sure that you can actually do that even if you did your last physical on Sunday and it is Friday afternoon. You got to measure that because you know you don't know. It all depends on the complexity of the transactions, number of wall files, all that stuff. And it's again, this is one of the things that are so different from what I was used to in, in the commercial world. Well, I, I just said, you know, I think because I'm also a SQL Server DBA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, um, you know, but it's still trying to get a handle around being able to manage something that. that yeah, and that understand that you can use, uh, I don't know, delayed replication, right? So if you have a DBA oops moment, right, uh, you have 20 minutes to recover or whatever you set the, the delay at, right? It's, it's yeah, which is not like Oracle Reboot, you know, which, you know, I mean, that's sort of an area yeah. where you almost, because you've got an enterprise world where they do stuff like that. They'll deploy and screw everything up in a half an hour, and then you've got to have some way to do a reboot. Mm -hmm. And so that's a tool area that I think a lot of people don't know how to do. Because yes, yeah, and that, that's really where the differences are, and I think that's where, on the one side, I think still Postgres has some figuring out to do to make it easier, but on the other side, all the tools are there. You just got to figure out how to use them and maybe exercise them once or twice before the oops moments, right? So. All right, well then, thanks, everybody. I hope it was useful.